Hot in My Noggin, hosted by CK Sims, creating a platform to elevate, educate, and heal by creating a space where people can share their stories of struggle, triumph, and redemption. CKS Media. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Pod My Noggin. I'm your host, CK Sims, and this week we have an author on our show. Um, an author whose book left me mesmerized this past week, um, Flora Chien. Hi, welcome, CK. Welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm good. Um, thanks for reading my book. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for sending this book. So I'm going to show the audience here. So it's South of the Yang Sea. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Perfect. And it is a Proverbs Prize winner of 2022. So let's talk about this book. I have some questions. Um, so first thing, I always like to be really honest. So when I first picked up the book, I was like, okay, I'm going to read it. Um, and I think I went into it thinking at first that it was going to be like, I have to read the book for the show. Right, mm -hmm. so almost like it was um, an obligation as a part as a part of something that I would potentially enjoy. Right? right, so I picked up the book and I started reading chapter one. And then in chapter one, you're, there's a, a bit of the Chinese language that you're using. Mm -hmm. And then my brain was sort of like, "Oh, this is going to be work. How do I pronounce these?" By chapter two, I you drew me in and. I found myself sitting in my armchair and reading and like, was like, okay, wait, what? And like going back and reading things again. I have to tell you that for a book that's on Chinese culture, right? Mm -hmm. You really wrote it in such a way that just drew me in and made me really interested in what was happening during that time in this book and how you perceived your culture. And even though I'm a Canadian and didn't know, it was almost like I was on that journey with Yunnan. Like, right. So I will tell you two things. One, I read the book in one sitting. Wow. I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was really enjoying the book two um i had several big emotions while reading this book really big emotions okay. so and i mean so big that i i sent your booking agents an email and was like i'm reading the book and <laughs> i'm just gonna say and i won't say the person's name but this character is icky mm -hmm. and that was my response to right and we'll right. talk about it uh -huh. But okay, so, so many cool things in this book. And I don't want to give a lot away because I want the readers to go out and purchase this book and mm -hmm. experience what I experienced. But I do have a question. Um, how much of this book, we, we know it's fictionalized, right. but how much of this book is based on your life? Right. Um, so it is definitely inspired by my life experiences growing up in the 1980s in Shanghai. Um, you know, I grew up with my grandparents. I lived with them, uh, just like the protagonist, Inan, uh, in a story. But I think the book is definitely fictional. Uh, okay. For example, in terms of characters, I'll give you an example. The grandfather character is a combination of both my paternal and maternal grandparents, okay. and also one of the brothers of one of the grandparents. So it's a mix of things, not only just my own life experience, but the life experience of people I know. So I think in fiction, what really matters here is the emotional truth, right? Not just the factual truth. And a more important question here, I think, is also the authorian distance. So how far away the author stands in terms of time, but also how far away from the events and their meanings. Mm. So I think the narrator, Inan, is definitely older 
she's in her mid thirties and she's looking back in terms of time. But on the other hand, she is also awakening to herself for the first time and uh, see these past early year experiences with a fresh new perspective. And I think she is transforming, you know, as she is narrating the story. So I think the emotional, yeah, distance is very close. And that's the kind of intimacy and uh, poignancy I want to create, you know, and I think this is, you know, what's special about the coming of age story. Well, you did that though. Like, I, I want to point out that the way it was written, how did you pronounce the main character's name? I said Yinan, but I don't think that's correct. Yes. Yeah, Yinan. 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 Yes. So, like, as I was reading Yinan narration and her story and going back in time, it was really, there was such an intimacy to it. There was such a, like a feeling of, I don't even, I'm trying to find the right words. It it felt like lived experience so much that in my mind, I found myself really wondering how much of Flora was in Ina. You know what I mean? And like in my brain, it was like, how could a fictional character be this intimate with these challenges that you that that Inan faced growing up in the 80s and 90s in China and just all of the different experiences right like because you really touch on and what I love about this book too is like just showing Chinese culture and how different it is in say Shanghai versus somewhere else right like right. how different it is in the countryside versus it is, versus mm-hmm. somewhere else and the different belief systems that you experience, like by province, and I found that really fascinating. And then the own the own inter prejudices amongst different groupings of Chinese people. Like I, I just I found that really yeah. fascinating. Right. Some of the things that you had mentioned that really stuck out for me. So I, I. What prompted you to write this book? Like, what was your journey to getting here? Okay, so I started this draft um, first in 2018 when I moved back to Hong Kong for the second time. And I took a trip with my husband. We we were just married a year ago and uh, with my parents to the ancestral village of my grandparents uh, in Zhejiang province. So Zhejiang is a large province, um, very prosperous, just beneath Shanghai. And during that trip, you know, I was reminded of uh, a lot of a lot of the cultural heritage in that area. Uh, you know, literature, calligraphy, uh, tea, silk, wine. Uh, you know, all the good things in Chinese culture that you can find a town in that area that is famous for it. So I had a lot of nostalgia of this world that I left behind. And I realized, you know, my family has been rooted in this area for over a thousand years. So my last name is Qian, right? Q-I-N. And uh, Qian is a very large name in this area. So there is a river called Qian River, uh, you know, and there are also temples honoring um, a past King Chen, um, which uh, ruled the area a thousand years ago. So I I felt a lot of, you know, unresolved feelings. Um, So starting this novel was um, my way of, uh, you know, figuring things out. And uh, later, while I was writing it, in 19, uh, the Hong Kong protests started. And I think that also provided a lot of exigence or urgency for me to finish the novel. So I think, you know, the Hong Kong pro-democracy protests have been going on for over a decade. Um, One thing has changed in 2019, I think, uh, because ever since Hong Kong was signed to be returned back to China, there's always a lot of sadness, a lot of confusion, bewilderment, and searching. But there is also this quiet unity, I think, that bond the society together. But in 2019, um, you know, maybe thanks to social media, whatever, I think the 
polarization of people's views and the color of their politics made people very lonely and unhappy. And, you know, this is very similar to what happened in the U.S. and all around the world. And at the time, I felt telling my story is、uh, my small way to build these bridges. You know, I think at the end of the day, it is not the novelist's main job to promote any political views, but actually to detail the nuances in humanity and. You know our common fears and desires. For example, the need to be loved, the need to be heard, and not to feel alone. Yeah. So I I wanted to contribute to that part of the discussion, and and I think that made me finish my novel. Well, it's beautiful. Like <laughs> the novel itself, the way it reads is just really beautiful, and it takes you back. And it calls. I don't. I didn't find that the book, in any way, shape, or form, picked a side politically or leaned anywhere. It was really about Enon's experience as a woman growing up in China, her own desire to be loved, right? And one of the things. One of the things I really loved in this book. And I know that that's how it's promoted is the struggle with language, and how to how you can express yourself, and her struggle with her expression growing up using what she characterized, I guess, as like old language or、mm-hmm. initially right. But then you watch as she continues throughout that story, and she finds herself back、right. into. A place where she's appreciating the old language and the simplicity、mm. of it, if you will,、um, and that resonated with me because I grew up in a small town in Canada, a very small town. And as you do when you're a child, you have limited language, right?、Mm-hmm. Like you don't have the vernacular that we have today. And、um, I think when I first realized. That I now possessed words to truly express how I felt was in grade eight, and I had this teacher. Her name was Mrs. Porter, and every week she taught us new words, like bigger words and how to use them and all of that stuff. And I remember in grade eight, my love for words and love for reading just sort of tripled.、Um, so yes,、yeah, so. I resonated with her. There was a, there was a. So I have to ask, actually, because I'm all over the place because there's parts of this book. So,、um, something that surprised me about Chinese culture back in the day was that the first American chain that you had in Shanghai was KFC. <laughs> right. Was that true? Like that's a、um, real thing. Yeah, I. I'm not exactly sure it's the first one, but that's the first one I remembered.、Uh, yeah, and it was a very popular place, of course.、Um, I can imagine, and like in the book, you talk about how people flocked there and had official ceremonies there. And、um, I want to keep making sure that I'm pronouncing the name wrong. Right, Inan. Inan, right. Inan, in- okay. Um, I loved how Inan's mom categorized the food at KFC. I loved that、um, <laughs> because it's true, right? It smells delicious, <laughs> but it, right. It, yeah, right. And I had never、yeah. thought of this part. That there was an anecdote in there about Coke tasted like medicine. Yeah, cough medicine. I think my mom still thinks this way. <laughs> Which is fine, and but I started to think about it, and I like to. When I read a book, I get very lost in it, and I feel all the, all of the emotions, and that that book did this to me, right? So it drew me in. It took it. It wasn't a work thing anymore after chapter two. It was like a, I was invested, and then but then I, when I was reading, when I finished reading it, I went downstairs to my relatives for dinner, and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I'm like, did I ever think that Coke tasted like? It was medicine, or 
was it something that I was used to or like, mm-hmm. I don't like Coke now because I find it too almost chalky or like your taste change over time. Right. Um, and then I'm like thinking to myself for someone who's never experienced Coke, who's an adult, who's an adult, like your mom in the book to try it for the first time when that's not your palate. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Like what would their experience be? And like, I was just, I just, the book caused me to live outside of myself a lot, to be with the characters and to just sort of experience and think about all of the different layers and complexities of the characters in the story. But we know mainstream media, they portray China in a specific way, and we know that certain things, but I think what this book really did for me was help me understand what it was like a little bit growing up as a female in China, but also the nature of expectations from your when you begin school to right. going through life. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I was following along with Yunan and I thought to myself, I'm like, this poor child. I'm like, when does she get to have fun? Right? <laughs> like, that's what I'm thinking about. When does she get to be okay. a child and, and uh-huh. do childlike things? I'm like, she's doing more homework than I did my entire, you know, 12, 13 (laughs) years in high school or in school. Like, so I found that also fascinating. And that was also your experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely was. Uh, I think, you know, I I lived in different places throughout my life. um, And I think that really allows you to see my own culture from uh, both an insider and outsider's perspective. Yes. Um, you know, looking back, I, I did feel, yes, I, I didn't have any fun <laughs> growing up, especially throughout my teenage years. Um, I think, you know, you talked about the expectations and I mentioned a little bit in my novel, I think oh, I'm part of this uh, one of a kind, one only child generation. And um, we had huge expectations uh, from our parents to excel um, both academically and in life because their generation uh, went through cultural revolution, which only ended in 1976, just a few years before I was born. And um, they wasted so much time during it. So they're putting all their dreams and expectations on us. you know, on the other hand, I think because of this um, this mandate, right? So the only child mandate lasted from 1979 to, I think, 2015. Of course, there's a lot of well-reported, you know, repercussions like the gender racial imbalance, um, forced abortions. But I also see that uh, women like my mother were able to have a career because she only has one child, uh, unlike the previous generations in Chinese history. And also girls. Girls uh, as only children has a lot of educational, the same education opportunities, at least in big cities where I grew up. But I, I, I did feel a lot of loneliness as a only child, of course, um, you know, and uh, these expectations from parents didn't help. <laughs> they only increased the competition, isolation. And I, I think, you know, that's also one of the reasons I started to read and write when I was younger. Because, uh, you know, the lack of peers made you realize, you know, you have to seek sometimes a uh, confidant uh, out you know, in time and space. And uh, I was elated when I found that option. It's it's fascinating. So did you find, can you look back and find that because you were a woman of an, and an only child that the expectations may have been higher on you than that of only child? Only child? Yeah, I think it is the same. We actually has a have a saying in China at a time, expecting your son to become a dragon and expecting your daughter to become a phoenix. So I think it's, yeah, it's equal, equal expectation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you discussed, I, I loved how you discussed, and I, I, I'm going to try this person's name, but I want you to correct me uh, because I love learning things, right? So um, 
you explored that isolation, but also some connection with Ji. Jia, right? Jia. 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 Yeah. Okay, Jia. So you explored with her, and that was a really interesting exploration because you found in those two characters you found companionship and mm -hmm. sort of a love for one another, but it was also slightly、uh, like. Restrained. It wasn't like you could fully embrace each other, but you took what you could get, sort of thing, because of the way culture and expectations played out. Right. Would you right. agree with that? Yes. Yes. So Jie is a character where the protagonist met in middle school, and、uh, she actually aspires to join a communist party. You know, in order to advance in life,、uh, which、yes. the protagonist does not agree with. Yeah, but they shared a lot of、uh, common interest in literature, and、uh, they bonded over, you know, some of the literary canon. And、um, I think their own interpretations of literature actually signifies their understanding of the conflicts in humanity and. You know, later they had their parting ways.、Um, eventually, yes. So I found that that relationship to be really well written. We're going to take a quick break. Break. We'll be right back. Life in Stitches by C.K. Sims. Available for purchase in paperback and ebook on all major platforms. Partner today with CK Sims and Pod and Minogan to get in front of an audience that cares. You will be supporting mental health stories, tales of resilience, and uplifting content, aligning your brand with bringing goodness, authenticity, and kindness front and center. This spot could be yours. Do you have a story of struggle and resilience? One that you want to share with others and possibly help someone through their own struggles. Find the link in the show description and fill out the guest form today. Welcome back, everyone. Before the break, we were talking to Flora Chen, perfect, and talking about her book South of the Yangtze. Yes. Okay, I'm doing good. Perfect, perfect. <laughs>、um, and we were talking about the different themes that are going on in the book and how it drew me in completely. I have to tell you that the storyline with Simon broke my heart. I'm not going to say anything else, but it broke my heart. And what? So and this is the part that I struggle with, Flora. Two questions now. Flora is your birth name. Because you stated, and and I want to bring this up in the book when you joined the when you left the sciences and you went in not you, Inan sorry and I、right. we're going to talk about this word Inan <laughs> left the sciences and then went into the arts. Her English name became Nancy, right? right? So right. is Flora your birth name or is it a English name? It it was an English name. It's not. We don't have birth English names. I didn't think so. So, what is your birth name? Oh If, my, yeah, my first name is Gu G U. Ah, and Qian is what was that meaning again? I, I was.、Uh, Qian Qian actually means money in Chinese. So Valley of Money. Yeah, I was made fun of by that, and when I was younger, they always call me Cash Valley. Cash. Oh my goodness. Okay, so Cash Valley. Okay. <laughs> um. So, when did you adopt Flora? I don't actually remember. I think I just liked the name. Maybe at the time I was reading, uh, you know, the Western mythology, and you know, I I just found it. Yeah, I like the sound、it's, of it. <laughs> it's a very pretty name, actually. Thank you. Ah,、uh, Flora Chang. Um. Okay. So Simon broke my heart, 
And there was a part in when him and Enon go to the beach and mm -hmm. he talks about his struggles. And that really broke my heart because I, in life, have struggled in similar ways. Not the full way, but I there see. was such a relatability with his struggles that just sort of touched my heart. And like, it's almost like I could truly understand him and his frustrations mm -hmm. and his distance and how he felt he couldn't truly connect to anything. And it brought me back to my childhood and my early adulthood and my struggles that were not the same. Cause I wasn't, I wasn't ever someone who was like highly academic, but there was always a disconnect between myself and the world. And like, I just felt that I couldn't grasp, couldn't get things. And I had hoped that that story would have ended or would have progressed in a different way, but it, it really resonated with me because I had the same experience as him, but I failed. I, I wasn't successful in what he, right. what he did. Right. And so this brings me back to just, I have so many questions and it's, I feel like I want you to write more books. I hope there's more books coming maybe <laughs> because I think you might have, you might have landed in one of my top author spots in my heart because you made me feel so much in telling the story. And this is where I continuously struggle with the fact that it's, I know it's based on your life experiences, but he none and her experiences are fictionalized. But you, the way you, and English is not your first language. And that's the part that's like mind blowing to me is how you convey so much relatability in the characters. It's, it's almost as if, and this is the part that's mind blowing to me. You really just got in there in Yinan and wrote a book, which is her retelling her life's experiences and her personal stories. And that's what, that's what it is. It, 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 and that's why, because I hadn't met you before and I knew that it was based on your experiences. As I was reading it, even though it was Yinan, I was thinking this must be Flora because the, <laughs> the details are so intimate in okay. in the telling of the story that it just feels yeah, yeah so when you're writing this book where was your head at? like where, where like how, what's your process i think i just start writing in the morning and um i stop when you know i'm too tired <laughs> So I, I just spend days and days just in front of the computer. Um, yeah. And how and, long, and then, why, I knew it was 2018 that you started it, mm -hmm. but like, if you were to sort of guesstimate time spent on the story itself, like how long would you say you spent writing? Um, I finished, you know, I finished the very first draft maybe a year later, um, but there's a lot of rewriting. Um, so it went through, uh, you know, five, six very different drafts. Um, you know, my very first draft actually started with a story of a monkey. <laughs> it's, it's very fantastical, lots of fantastical elements. It's very different from the draft today. But you know, writing is a discovery experience. Um, you really have to start walking um, to know where you are going. That makes sense. I love that. And what's really interesting is I read somewhere that you have you have translated popular books as well into Chinese. Right, right. Yeah. So I in Shanghai, I my first job, I worked in a publisher very briefly. Um, so I was a translator. And uh, one of the books I translated was uh, Sophie Kinsella's uh, book. She's a best-selling uh, romance author uh, called Shopaholic and Sister. It, it's a series yes. and it was quite popular at the time. So that's kind of cool. And then when did you know, I think that that's something I'm curious about too, is like, when I know you said 2019, but what or 2018, sorry, but was there a specific time before that that you just knew in your heart or you had the thought, 
one day I want to write a book. Um, right. I have always aspired to do that, even as a child. But I think that didn't become an option.、Uh, I think around twenty eleven, twenty twelve, when I first heard,、uh, you know, there is actually an MFA program、uh, that I can start doing that more professionally. You know, I didn't know such thing existed、um, all my life, and once I I knew that, I started taking、uh, classes、uh, after work, and I met with writing group friends, and that really opened up a whole new world. And a year later, after I applied to schools, I I quit my job in the financial sector, and yeah, in 2014, I I did a MFA for two years in the U.S.、Uh, in creative writing. Well, I'm glad you did because we、yeah. have this book. So now, I will tell you that I would love to know or love to see another.、Uh, Enan book. I would love that.、Um, you know、uh, what happens next for her, and、um, it, it's it's yeah, it's really beautiful. Do you have plans for a future book? Yes, I'm actually only recently start thinking about my next project.、Uh, so I have a three year old, <laughs> and、uh, she's finally going to school for the full day、uh, this semester. And I'm finally having a little bit more mental space, so I I think you know motherhood can be、um, a theme to explore. Maybe Ina becomes a mother. <laughs> you know,、um, I like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think another thing I'm always very interested in is the Chinese folk tales. Yes. Um. So I grew up with my grandparents, and、uh, they enjoyed、uh, this regional opera called Yue Opera. Uh, which has a lot of interesting stories with historical context. So, for example, one of the stories I mentioned a little bit in my novel is the story of Xi Shi,、uh, who is this beautiful woman responsible for the war between two neighboring kingdoms. And、um, of course, later you think about it, there is a lot of、um, unconscious bias、um, brought by these. Early stories, you know, women are often seen as the scapegoat、uh, by、mm-hmm. the for the downfall of kingdoms. And but some of the other stories, I think, folk tales with fantastical elements, especially, they、um, express people's wishes in the face of、uh, tyranny and also the helplessness against、um, you know fleeting life itself. So there's this story of a woman's tears、uh, broke down the Great Wall because her husband died building for it. You、yes. mentioned that、yes. in here, yes. Yes, that's in the book. And、um, there is also the story of Monkey King. I always love that. Do you know the story of Monkey King? I don't think so. Is it? A, it's、yeah. on the book, right? No, it's.、Uh, I think. Maybe mention it, but it's not、uh, explored in a book. So that is one of the four Chinese classics. The, the book is called Journey to the West. It was published in Ming Dynasty. So Monkey King doesn't have parents. He was born from a rock, and、uh, he's such a rebellious character. He doesn't listen to anybody, including the you know the Jade Emperor in heaven, the Dragon King. <laughs> In the ocean, and he traveled to hell、uh, in order to cross his name off from the book of life and death, so he can be immortal. It's、oh. it's a more exciting version of the Gilgamesh story, I think. So I'm always very connected、uh, to these these you know the earliest stories I knew, and now I have a daughter. I'm starting to introduce to her some of these stories.、Um, And I know a lot of、uh, writers, academics in the West. They are exploring these folk tales, you know, seeing them in the light of, say, feminism and so forth. So I find exploring folk tales from China very rewarding too. And I hope maybe they can, you know, move their way into my next project. That would be exciting. So what I love seeing. 
as of late is a lot of Asian characters and celebrities and actors and and prominent figures finally getting the Mm -hmm. spotlight in mainstream media in the West Mm -hmm. Um, and just learning more about them and experiencing their lives and the way they think about others. We, we get, we get uh, opinionated media snippets, right? From other parts of the world where the information that we receive is very controlled. And when I look at talking to you, reading a book like this or watching good movies that were made by Chinese or other Asian um, individuals who are telling their stories of their cultures, we, le- we tend to learn and understand more about how they grew up, how they view the world, how they interact with the world. And like you did a really good job in this book of explaining just the pressures and the expectations that a child has to endure in the one child mandate, right? Right. Um, yeah. And like for us in the West over here, we don't, ha- we didn't have anything like this. So I like stories and books from different cultures that really explain and show us an unbiased viewpoint into what life was like for other people right and i think that you do that so i would i will keep following you um, in any project you write i will read it because i think that that's fascinating to be able to understand there's parts where you talk about in the book how limited um, the characters can be in uh, the older language and how it doesn't allow you to fully express yourself. That's, that's just a really interesting way to look at language and realizing that it could be limited. And then as you grew older, you understood more and you could express more. I love that. I love, I love the exploration. So anybody who's who's not read South of the Yangtze, you need to go and purchase this book and just truly let yourself fall into it. Um, What was I going to say? I just had another thought on my mind and it went away. Um, So you got projects, you have a three-year-old daughter, which is going to be a handful, definitely, right? right? Um, (laughs) So, and you're, and you're going to potentially write some more. Are you living in the U.S. now? Or are you living? Yes, yes. So in the beginning of this year, my family relocated again to the U.S. Uh, I'm based in New York City right now. How do you feel like just your day to day? What's the biggest differences for you? Uh, as compared to China, right? Um, yeah. I think <laughs> day to day, there are small things, you know, before coming to the u.s i didn't know that american stoves have four or five burners because <laughs> i was used to only have two <laughs> okay. you know in china um yeah yeah small things like that but i i think in the u.s what struck me the most is how people are so unapologetic about their personal needs and ambitions you know because i think growing up in a more collective culture this is something that was discouraged and even judged upon and i think this started at a very young age when people praised you for the sacrifice you made for your family your community and eventually your country and i think you know um i I see my three-year-old and I think the, you know, I understand now the egocentrism of a young yes. child is, it's just a matter of fact, it's a phase in life. And, you know, I think when nowadays parents treat that so gently and diplomatically, and I think this actually increases their confidence later in life um, when their bases are solid, they can be you know, they can attend to the needs of others. And I think in China, on the other hand, that unreasonable selflessness is so emphasized emphasized when I was growing up, which is against human nature. And I think that could make people um, from a very young age 
learn to put on a show in front of people they know, and they can be extremely selfish in front of people they don't know. You know,、um, I finally understand. You know the. Some of the bad behaviors of Chinese tourists overseas. So I, yeah, that that I think I, I always think about that difference. The cultural difference. I think we saw that a little bit with Jia. Yeah, Jia. Right. Who she、right. in? She followed the rules and, and played the part, but a little、mm-hmm. bit on the outside was a little bit more selfish in the sense of what she what she did and how she went about things, but. You know, I think perhaps that the Chinese way is one extreme, and the American、right. way is another extreme. And it wouldn't hurt for us to sort of meet in the middle, and、right. for it to be a little more balanced. While you can definitely prioritize certain things, like your desires, where you want to experience specific things in your life and do specific things in your life, but also look at how that may impact and affect those that you love and care for around you. And there's a balance there, right? Where we right. can, we can, we can have both, but it's、mm-hmm. not selfish nor selfless. It's it's in the middle. Right, it's a fine balance, and I I think as one gets older, the letting go of self is you know <laughs> it's really useful. It's just not ideal starting from a very young age. No, I would agree. I think that the balance should be taught definitely from a young age, because、um, it's it's I guess yin and yang, right? It's it's the balance of right. The two things. When I was in my twenties, as I discussed, I was very ego centric. And now, while I have my aspirations and things that I want to do, I realize that my integrity is not for sale. Right. So that it you want things and you desire things, but they must happen in a kind, balanced way because. My needs don't trump anybody else's. That's how, where I have landed now at forty-three. I think we're born very close to each other. I was in eighty-one. I see. Yeah. Yeah. You were just a little bit older. <laughs> I'm perfect. Yes.、Yeah, so, but thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for writing this book. Anybody who wants to read, which I encourage you to do, get out there and purchase. Um, and keep an eye out for future writings from Sura <laughs> Chen. Thank you, CK. Thank you. I enjoyed I the wish... conversation. Yes, I, as did <laughs> I.、Um, and I hope and wish you the best. And I hope that、um, your daughter is successful in life. And yeah, thank you. You'll have more time、uh, to write new works that we can read <laughs> in the future. Right, fingers crossed.、Thanks. Fingers crossed. And to everyone at home, until next time, go out there and live your wild. For media and sponsorship inquiries, email info at ksims dot com or visit ksims dot com and fill out the contact form. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. A new episode airs every Saturday. CKS Media.